So uh, there in 1 Kings chapter 6 might seem like a bit of an unusual chapter to read for our anniversary. But I want you to look at verse number 14 there, 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse number 14, and what Solomon is building, right? What, he, what is he building? He's building the first temple, Solomon's temple, right? And it says there in verse number 14, so Solomon built the house and finished it. The title for the sermon this afternoon is Built the House and finished it built the house and finished it so i think you know where i'm going with this now when you look at what this is about okay and as brother anthony did a great job reading that for us you know there's a lot of detail wasn't there there was a lot a lot to get through and just just a, a, a very detailed work that solomon had to do for the house of god and listen the first point that i want to bring to your attention is that when we're building something for the lord god we have to take care of the details all right we need to make sure that everything is how jesus christ wants it it needs to be put together it requires a lot of work it requires a lot of manpower to build this house of God now look at verse number one first Kings chapter 6 and verse number one it says and it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziph which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord and so the first thing I just want to bring to your attention is this first temple, this very beautiful, rich temple that Solomon built, is called the house of the Lord. Okay? Now, is a house important? Absolutely. I'm sure a lot of you guys enjoy the house that you live in, right? Maybe some of you own your house and you want it a special way. You want it a certain way, right? You work hard to pay for your rent or you work hard to pay for your mortgage. There are little improvements that you want to make for your own personal house. And while that's important to you, you know what is important to the Lord? His house. And he calls his house this temple that was being built by Solomon. Okay? So that's the first thing. This is God's house. You know, if our house is important to us, how much more than the house of the Lord? All right? Now look at, drop down to verse number 9. Drop down to verse number 9. And it says here, So he built the house and finished it. And he covered the house with beams and planks of cedar. Now, I know it says that he finished it. You may have the impression that all the job was finished. But no, there's a lot more to this chapter, okay? What was finished was a stage of construction, right? Probably here, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the building as a whole, like the, the outside. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen construction. You know, you start with a foundation, the concrete foundation. Then they build the frames. And then they, they do the outside cladding and the roof. And from the outside, it looks like, wow, this is finished. Look at it. It's built. It's done. It's finished. But really, there's a lot more work to be done. And quite often, the internals require even more work than what was done on the external. And so when it says here in verse number 9, so he built the house and finished it, it's the body. It's the body of the house that was finished. But there's still more to be done. But I want you to notice, he built it and he finished it. And brethren, we're celebrating two years as Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Okay, The New Testament church is the house of God. And listen, we're building it's not done. It's not finished. We need to keep. Yes, we're getting to different stages of construction, different stages of, of growing this church, you know, spiritually, in, in quantity, but also in quality. We keep building, but we need to make sure that we finish it. You notice how many times this is mentioned. Solomon built the house and finished it. And brethren, when we started this church two years ago, you know, I, I came here to start this church, right, with the families that were involved from the very beginning. And brethren, let me tell you, I want to finish the job. I don't want to leave it half done. I don't want to leave it a quarter done. I want to leave it finished. That's what we see in the Bible when it comes to the house of God. Drop down to verse number 14. Verse number 14. It says, so Solomon built the house and finished it. Oh, again, Solomon. Yeah, the next stage. The next stage of construction is done, right? He built the house and he finished it. Notice that about Solomon. Okay, he gets to work. He wants to make sure the work gets done. And so this is the different stage of completion. And you know, this might be similar today. Uh, thank God, you know, I got to work in a construction company for a, for a little time, for a couple of years. And so I got to see what it's like to build a house, right? And so first, you know, you, you get a plumber, the plumber gets in, gets the plumbing done, and then you get the concreter to come in, and he lays the foundation, right? And then, you know what? Do you start building straight away? Do you start putting some frames straight away? No, someone's got to go, the site supervisor, the certifier needs to go to the, to the work and say, yes, this is done. Yes, it's been put in the right place. Yes, construction can continue, right? That stage is finished, but then more needs to be done. And so you get the carpenter to come in, right? He puts the frames up, the wooden frames, the roof, and that gets done. And then that gets checked. That gets finished. That gets checked off. Yes, that's done. 
But then, do we just finish there? No, then you get the outside clad in. Like I said, you get the outside. Again, it looks good from the outside, but internally, it requires a lot of work. So you get your electrician, right, to come in. You get the, the guy doing the floors, you know, the floorboards or the tiles coming in to do his work. You're getting the guy to put in the kitchen and the, and the uh, toilets and, and whatever it is, you know, the inbuilt wardrobes, whatever it is that you're building in the house, there are stages that need to be completed. But notice, we need to finish the job. And brethren, when it comes to Blessed Hope Baptist Church, the job's not finished. There's a lot more to do. I'm very thankful for where we are in two years. I never thought we'd be where we are today. When we started this church, honestly, I had no vision. I had no idea. It was a band-aid church. It was kind of an emergency church, right? Because of the situation that we found ourselves in. And listen, you know, we started this church because I cared for the families. And I still care for the families that made up this church. I was concerned that people might get discouraged from church. I was concerned people would go stop going soul winning. I was concerned that people would stop having fellowship and, and have the contact with one another. And so let's just do a band-aid solution. Let's just start New Life Baptist Church Sydney. We caught it back then, right? But now we've been able to grow the church. The church has been grown. It wasn't just those initial families. We've had other people come join the church. We've had other men who are able to preach. Praise God for that. And hey, at the start of the year, we became an independent body. Blessed Hope Baptist Church, okay? So what we're doing is we're building. And before we go to the next stage, we're checking the building. We'll make sure that it's sound. We'll make sure that it's been built correctly before we can take the next stage. Now you say to me, well, Pastor Kevin, how long? How long is this building? When are we going to be finished? What's your vision now? Well, let's drop down to verse number 38. 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse number 38. It says, And in the eleventh year... In the month Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof. Now it's completely done, right? All the parts thereof, and according to all the fashion of it, so was he seven years in building it. Seven years in building it. Listen, when you're building the house of God, you want to take your time. You want to make sure it's done right. You want to make sure the details are put in. You want to make sure that it's moving forward. You want to make sure it gets finished, it gets done. We are two years into this project. And brethren, when we started this church, I don't know if I was exaggerating, but I, I made a promise. I said, look, I'm willing to go 10 years. <laughs> that, was my, that was my plan. I said, look, I'm, I'm going to keep coming down to Sydney for 10 years if I have to, just to make sure we finish what we started. All right, to finish what we started. And look, I'm not trying to be a hero here. Okay? Everyone's been involved. Everyone's been a help. If not for all of you, it wouldn't be a church. There'd be no point of me coming down here if there was nobody that wanted to be uh, to build this house of God, to, to be a service to the Lord. And that is ultimately who we are serving. The house of God belongs to God. It doesn't belong to Pastor Kevin. It doesn't belong to anybody in this church. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And so what I wanted to show you here, brethren, in 1 Kings chapter 6, this is the first temple. Okay? So this is Old Testament times. Of course, after Moses has come on the scene, God's given Moses the, the, the commandments, he's given Moses the law, and they build the house of God. But you know the house of God is so important, it's found from the very beginning of the Bible till the very end. Okay? Even before the Old Testament, there was a house of God. Okay? And the house of God evolves, it changes over time, and what was the house of God before is no longer the house, and it gets replaced by the newer house of God. So we're going to do a quick Bible study. Please go to Genesis 28. You don't need to say in 1 Kings anymore. Please go to Genesis 28 and verse number 12. Genesis chapter 28 and verse number 12. So we're going before the time of Moses. We're going to Jacob. All right. This is before the Old Testament. I know, I know Genesis is an Old Testament book. But the story of Jacob is before the Old Testament has come into effect, right? So this is before the Old Testament, and even before the Old Testament, there was a house of God. We pick up the story here where Jacob uh, has a dream. I don't know if you guys remember this dream where he sees a ladder to heaven and he sees these angels descending and ascending, right? Look at verse number 12. It says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, <clears throat> and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood up above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Now drop down to verse number 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Verse number 17, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? There is none other, so this is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. 
Hey, this is the first time the house of God is mentioned. The house of the Lord. It's this place where he sleeps, he has this dream, the Lord appears, and then he gets afraid, right? It said uh, in verse number 17, and he was afraid. He said, how dreadful is this place? He was full of dread, right? He was afraid. And brethren, let me tell you something. It's a healthy thing to have a fear of God. It's very healthy, very healthy. Listen, before I get up to preach, I have... uh, the, the most fear I have of God is before I get up to preach. Right? Because I'm standing before God's children, God's sons and daughters. This is His house. And I'm just doing the best I can, a fallen man, a weak man who can make mistakes, you know, to take God's word and preach God's word. All right? And I get nervous. And you know, I get a little bit excited. And then I'm like, God, please, if I say something wrong, please don't chastise me. I'm doing the best I can, Lord, with what I can see in the Bible. Look, there's, there's a healthy fear of God. And listen, what did, what did Jacob say? He says in verse number 16, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. You see, the house of the Lord is a place where we come to meet God, where God's presence is. Okay? So this is before the Old Testament. right? We see this play out. Actually, let's keep reading. Let's go to verse number 18. Genesis 28, verse number 18. It says, And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows... So he had some stones that he used to sleep on. And then it says here, and set it up for a pillar. Now that's important for you to remember. And poured oil upon the top of it. Please remember this, because we're going to come back to this right at the end of the sermon, right? So he takes these uh, pillows, he sets it up for a pillar. Okay, it's uh, an object that's standing upright. Then he takes oil and pours oil on top of it. He anoints it with oil. Okay, now you might not understand that, but I'll get to it soon. Verse number 19. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. So he calls this place Bethel. Now, if you don't know, El, Beth El, El is a reference to God, okay? And Beth is house, okay? So Bethel means house of the Lord or house of God, okay? So this is the first time we see the house of God being mentioned. Now, the next house of God is in, if you can please go, go to Exodus uh, Uh, 34. Go to Exodus 34 verse 26. So we're fast forwarding a little bit in our Bibles. So this is after Israel come out of Egypt, Moses leading the people of God, and there is a new house of God that is constructed in Exodus 34 verse number 26. Now I'm not going to read the whole context here. You guys can read it in your own time. But these are the instructions God gives to the nation of Israel to build the tabernacle. Okay, the tabernacle was a, like a tent. It was meant to be something that they could carry with them. They could easily pack it up because remember in the wilderness, they were traveling from one place to another place. And so they would set it up. And then when it was time to move, they would pack it up and they would, they would take the tabernacle with them. So it's something they could, they could transport. And in Exodus 34 verse 26, it says, The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. So what is the tabernacle called? The house of of the Lord thy God. So this is now the house of God in the Old Testament, the tabernacle. In fact, it says in Exodus, you don't need to turn to Exodus 25 verse 8. It says here, And let them make me a sanctuary, and that, that sanctuary is a tabernacle, that I may dwell among them. These are the words of God. It says, look, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. What did we learn about the house of God originally? That's where Jacob met God, right? That's where God is. And God says, make me a tabernacle, make me a sanctuary. That's where I'm going to dwell with you. Now look, God is uh, uh, omnipresence. God is everywhere. But there's something about the house of God that he wants you to know that his glory, his presence is in that place. Okay? Then we fast forward. Please go to Matthew 21. Go to Matthew 21. We fast forward, so after we have the kings that come into place, we have King, you know, King Saul, then King David, then King Solomon, Solomon being David's son. When we get to King Solomon's time, what we read in 1 Kings chapter 6 is when Solomon builds the first temple. It's called Solomon's temple. Okay, it's the great temple. And we already saw that that temple is called the house of God. So that, that temple replaces the tabernacle okay, as, as a more of a fixed building, as it were. Okay? And, and the Bible clearly called that the house of God. All right. Now, we fast forward into history. Furthermore, the two kingdoms, or the nation of Israel, gets divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Then the Babylonians come along with their great power, and they take into captivity the Jews of the southern kingdom. They destroy the city. They destroy the temple. And then they're in captivity, right? That's what the stories of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those kinds of stories. Eventually, 70 years later, the Jews are brought back to the land. If you all know that story, that's basically the history of the, of the Jews there. 
But when they come back, they come back to build Jerusalem and they also come back to build the temple. So it's not the same temple that Solomon built, it's a lesser temple. Okay? Uh, it's, it's not as beautiful, it's not as great as Solomon's temple, but it is a second temple. And I'll, before we go to Matthew 21, I'll just read to you in Ezra chapter 1 verse 5. So Ezra was one of the preachers there at this time. It says, Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised, to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. So the second temple, what does the Bible call it? These are the words of the Holy Spirit. He calls it the house of the Lord. Okay, so the second temple. Now, what's so special about the second temple? What's special about the second temple is when Jesus Christ was walking on the earth 2,000 years ago, that was a temple he was dealing with. It was the second temple. It wasn't Solomon's temple. It was the rebuilt second temple, which is the house of the Lord. Now, you guys go to Matthew 21, verse 12, and probably the most famous story of Jesus and the temple is when he makes the whip and drives out those that are buying and selling, right? That's probably one of the most famous stories. In Matthew 21, verse 12, it says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. So he's driving out all these guys that are buying and selling. And by the way, this is why in our house, in this house, in the church, we will never buy and sell. You know, if you need a hymn book, you take a hymn book home. You don't pay for a hymn book. You need something. If you need to make exchange with somebody in this church, don't do it in the house of God. Okay? Do it in your own time outside of this because I don't want Jesus coming here with a whip driving us away right? because of money changing. Right? Why is Jesus so angry though? Have you ever wondered? Why is he so angry? Look at verse number 13. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. So this second temple, what is it called? My house. What does Jesus call it? My house. It's his house. Who's Jesus Christ, the Lord God? Hey, he's talking about the temple being the house of the Lord. His, his house. That's why he's so angry. Imagine someone coming to your house, you know, and doing whatever they want with your house. You'd get angry too. You'd get a whip out there. And it's like, get out of here. Who are you guys? All right? This is my house. And that's what Jesus Christ was doing when he drove these, uh, you know, money changes away. So that's the second temple. And of course, we know when Christ came, he died on the cross. And through his sacrifice, by his shed blood, he brought in the new covenant. He brought in the New Testament. And today, in 2020, we live in New Testament times, okay? Is there a house of God today? Well, there is. And if you can please go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I really want you to see this one. Please go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15. Is there a house of God? Because we know in 70 AD, that second temple was destroyed. Okay, Jesus Christ prophesied that there would not be one brick left upon another. Okay, so if you go to Israel or, you know, uh, um, Palestine today, Right? You're not going to see that second temple. It's been, it's been destroyed. I'm glad it's been destroyed because actually it's been replaced by a better house of God. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, Paul writing to Timothy, who was a pastor, he says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. What's the house of God? Is it the temple? It says here, Which is the church of the living God. Notice the next words. The pillar and ground of the truth. Now, when we go back to the very first house of God, what did Jacob do? He set up a pillar. He anointed the pillar with oil. All right, now, the New Testament church, what is it? The pillar and ground of truth. These are things that connect for us in the Bible. So we can definitely see it's the same house. And brethren, when we come to Blessed Up Baptist Church, on, to service, we are coming to the house of God. I'm not talking about these walls. I'm not talking about these floors. I'm not talking about the ceiling. I'm talking about the people, the church. Church means congregation. It means assembly. When we come together, what did Jesus say? He says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there will I be in the midst of them. Okay, so yes, just like the Old Testament house of God had the presence of God, when we come to church, we're coming to see Jesus Christ. We're coming to be in his presence for God to do a work in our hearts, for the Holy Spirit to help the preacher, for us to honor him, to give him praise, to give him worship for the joyful noise of our lips and our, hopefully our hearts reflect the truth what that's coming out of our mouth there okay so we come to meet god and what was it called what did jacob say he called it the um the gates of heaven didn't he remember he called it the gates of heaven well that's what a church is brethren our job is to get people through those gates okay if it's not us who's going to do it listen you know one of them the main ministry of a church and if churches aren't doing this they're not the gateway to heaven 
Okay, they're not showing people the gates of heaven. The primary ministry, once we worship God, we, we learn from His Word, is to get out there and preach the gospel. To go there, give people the gospel, show people the gates of heaven, how they can freely enter through the door of Jesus Christ. And so that is the New Testament church. Now, please, I'll get you to turn to, uh, go to Hebrews chapter 3. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. I'll read a few other passages to you while you're turning there. Hebrews chapter 3. We are building Blessed Hope Baptist Church, and we're not done. You say, who's building it? Is it you, Pastor Kevin? Well, I'll read to you in Matthew 16, verse 18. These are the words of Jesus. Matthew 16, verse 18. It says, And I say unto thee, thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What did Jesus say? Did he say, Pastor Kevin, you're going to preach it? You're going to build it? Did he say, Peter, you're going to build it? He says, no, I will build my church, said Jesus Christ. Hey, who's building Blessed Hope Baptist Church? Who's been building this for the last two years? It's been Jesus Christ. It's his church, okay? He's the master builder. He's the one that's in charge. And boy, we're just employees of Jesus Christ. We're just servants of Jesus Christ, trying to do his will in our life. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord build the house. Now, I know the context of that psalm is your family. Your family is considered a house as well. Hey, but the principle is true. For the house of God, it's the Lord that has to build it. Otherwise, we're laboring in vain. And brother, you know, I've not, sisters, I've not been coming here for two years to labor in vain. Vain emptiness. No, we want to build something. We want something that God can be pleased when He looks down. We want some a uh, place where you can learn, where you have the ground and pillar of the truth, where God's truth is being proclaimed from His Word. So you're in Hebrews chapter three and verse number two. So it's very clear that the Lord has to build His house. Okay, and this is important because if we think it's us, it's going to fill us with pride. It's going to cause us to be puffed up. It's going to think, look what we can achieve right with what we've done that's the wrong approach but we have to have the right balance here god will use his people god will use his children to build the house even though he's the master builder right just like you've got a master builder he gets his site supervisor out there the site supervisor oversees right i guess maybe i'm the site supervisor he's the master builder in a sense because i've got the authority as the pastor here but then the site supervisor gets out the concreter right? He gets out, you know, then that guy gets his job done, then you get the carpenter out, then you get the electrician, you get the plumber, you get all the people, you know, the, the, the tiler, you get all the people that's necessary to work the job, okay? So yes, even in the case of building a house, you use multiple people, you use multiple skills, and brethren, God wants to use you to build Blessed Hope Baptist Church. You're important, okay? I'm part of the project, but you're all part of the project of building this church. Now look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 2. Referring to Jesus, it says, who was faithful to him that appointed him. So Jesus is faithful, and then it says this, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So it's saying here that Jesus is faithful just like Moses was faithful. Now, in what way was Moses faithful? This is speaking about the house of Israel. So obviously, Moses was used by God to get them out of Egypt, to lead them, to guide them in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses was faithful to the house. Okay, and again, let's take the principle here. Let's think about the church because this is the house of God. All right, so we want to be faithful to the work that God has given us to do. And by the way, the you know when the Israelites were in the wilderness, the Bible refers to that as the church in the wilderness. Okay, the congregation, the church that was in the wilderness. And so Moses, as a picture or as a type, is like an Old Testament pastor. Just picturing a New Testament pastor, he had other responsibilities. He was the law as well for the, for the nation, so that, that's a bit different. But, you know, he does picture, he does uh, typify what a New Testament pastor is supposed to be. So my desire is to be like Moses. That, you know, as a pastor, that's what I should be striving to be like, right? Let's keep going. Verse number uh, three. It says, for this man, that's speaking of Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, absolutely, inasmuch as he who have built the house have more honor than the house. Okay, so we need to make sure if we, when we come to church and we give someone honor, it's not to the house that we give honor to, it's the one that builds the house. That's being Jesus Christ. We come here to serve him. Now look at verse number four. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Okay, so who's building Blessed Hope Baptist Church? Yeah, some man. 
Some of us, right? We're all contributing to this church being built, but ultimately, who's the master builder? Who's in charge of it all? Who's building it all? It's, of course, it's God, okay? So again, we can't get prideful, pat ourselves on the back, well done. Now, let's celebrate two years. Praise God. Praise God. Thank God for two years. That's who we thank, right? We thank Him because He's the one that's building. Let's keep going. Verse number five. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Now look, as I said, I hope to be like Moses. Okay, it says here, and Moses verily or truly was faithful in all his house. Brethren, I've been given the authority over two house of gods, of God. Okay, the one on the Sunshine Coast and here. You know, New Life Baptist Church and Blessed Hope Baptist Church. My desire is to be faithful to both these houses. You know, yes, New Life Baptist Church is my priority. Okay, that's where I'm mostly focused on. But I really want you to know that I want to be faithful to Blessed Up at this church. I want to make sure we continue building this church. I want to finish the work. I want to get to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. You say, what does it look like when it's finished? This is what I'm expecting. This is what I want for this church. I have a vision now. I didn't two years ago. I do now. Okay, and that vision is that we go to three services a week, two on Sunday, a midweek service. That midweek service is a prayer night. And listen, I'm not saying you all have to be part of it. I mean, I hope so. But, you know, by having more services, we're going to open up other times for other people to visit our church. It will help the church grow. It will allow uh, more doctrine, more teaching to be taught from the Word of God, allow people to grow in knowledge and wisdom, okay? That's number one. Number two, I want a permanent place, like a lease, like something that we know this is a place that we're going to be pretty much at, you know, unless there's some major change or we outgrow the place, we need a permanent place, hopefully a lease. And number three, a full-time pastor, okay? That's when I say, we're finished, okay? When we can have all these things in place, a full-time pastor, yes, I'm the pastor here, but I'm really a part-time pastor. I do the best I can. We've had, you know, uh, coming out on Tuesdays every now and again and trying to take calls and, and all the things that I do uh, for, your, for the church here. But I'm really part-time. I am full-time at New Life Baptist Church, but really here I'm part-time. We need to get to the point where we can have a full-time pastor here at Blessed Up Baptist Church. That's my vision. I want to be faithful to that vision. I want to be faithful to this church, to this house of God. I want to finish the job. And brethren, I need your help to do it. I need your help to accomplish the job. And notice it says here, um, sorry, I've lost my... Verse number five. And Moses was faithful to... Uh, was, uh, verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. And brethren, that's what I am. You know, yes, I've been given authority in the church, but I'm operating as a servant. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. I am Jesus Christ's servant. I'm here to serve this body. Okay? And anytime anybody has the opportunity to preach or to song lead, or it's just to do whatever. The lady's bringing some food. You know, that's been a blessing to the church. Listen, you do it as a servant. You know, you do it because you're serving Jesus. You're serving the house of God. Okay, that is the right perspective to have. Otherwise, it's easy to be lifted up with knowledge. It's easy to be lifted up by success. And so many pastors have failed. So many pastors, you know, end up thinking, well, it's because of me. It's because of the way I speak, because of the way I organize things. No, it's because of Jesus. And thank God he can use men, fallen men, you know, to do his work. Praise God. Otherwise, man, I'd be doing nothing for Jesus, right? Because we are all weak. We are all fallen. And look at verse number six now. It says, but Christ as a son over his own house. What is the house of Jesus? Whose house are we? That's you, brethren. That's you and me. We are his house. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And brethren, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to finish the job. We're trying to stay firm to the end because we are his house. You know, thank God for this building. Thank God we have these walls and these floors, even though it's a little rough, right? But that's not the building. That's not the house that God is concerned with. He's concerned with you. You are his house. When we come together, the congregation, the assembly, that is the church. That is the house of God when we're together here you know, uh, to, to give worship to Jesus Christ. Okay? Keep that in mind. That's so important. That is so important. There are too many churches that lose focus on material gain, on big buildings. And I'm, I'm not against those things. I think those things are wonderful when the time comes. But what's more important is that we invest in people spiritually in the quality of people's spiritual life so you can live more godly. That's my hope for you, brethren. We are the house of God. Please turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. 
Please go to Ephesians chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from 1 Peter chapter 2. You go to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5. I just want to reinforce this teaching, okay? Jesus Christ is not interested in a physical building. He's interested in you, in me, in us, okay? 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5 says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So what are we called? Lively stones. Just like when you're building a house, you're using bricks. Well, those bricks are you and me. We are those lively bricks that Jesus wants to use to build his spiritual house. Then it says in verse number six, uh, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. So we do have to have a chief cornerstone. We do have to have a foundation by which we build on. What is that chief cornerstone? It says this, And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So this chief cornerstone is a him, a him that we can believe on. And of course that is salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen? So the foundation is Jesus Christ. Then on Christ he wants us to be built upon him the house of God, these lively stones. You're in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 19. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. All right, look at verse number 20. And are built upon, so we're built upon something, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Let's stop there for a moment. Where is the foundation of the apostles and prophets? Say, well, you know, the Apostle Paul is not here anymore. Neither is Peter and John and James, right? Or the prophets of old, they're not here, you know, John the Baptist and, and Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, who else? I mean, so many prophets, I can't even think about, you know, who all they are. You know, you say, how do we build on that? Well, you know where we find their writings? In the Bible, in the Word of God. We find the writings of the prophets and of the apostles. And so if we're going to build upon something, it's going to be built on the Bible. It's going to be built on the Word of God. But then it says this, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So there's the confirmation that the cornerstone there, the chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. Verse number 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord's. Notice it grows, right? The building fitly framed together groweth. It's not like you just start it and it ends. It grows. It needs to continue growing, this church. Blessed up Baptist Church needs to continue to grow unto a holy temple in the Lord. Verse number 22. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So when we come together, when we inhabit together, we're here and the Holy Spirit of God can do a work in our hearts, in our minds, you know, as we seek to, to bless the Lord. So I'm sure you already knew this, but I just wanted to confirm to you, you are the church, you are the building, you are that spiritual building, you are the stones that make up the, the building that God wants to indwell. So when we look at the buildings of old, when you look at the Old Testament temple of old, yeah, that was a physical building, but what was that then? That was a type, that was a picture of the spiritual building that would come, and that is the local New Testament church. Now, if you can please turn to Luke chapter 14, please go to Luke chapter 14 for me. Luke chapter 14. Let me repeat to you my vision for Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Okay? I guess I consider myself the site supervisor. Okay? Now, I'm not the builder. The builder is Jesus Christ. Jesus employs me as the pastor to oversee, to be the site supervisor, all right? And there's a lot of work to be done. All right? So. The finished product, once again, what does it look like? What is the vision for Blessed Up Baptist Church? Number one, three services. Two on Sunday, one on, th uh, well, I'll, t I'll go for that, one midweek service, right? And I want that midweek service to eventually become a prayer meeting time as well. So maybe a shorter sermon, but a time for praying, a, prayer, a time for us. And I know that sometimes we do this, okay? And I'm not saying, so we're building toward this. We're trying to make this a stable thing, all right? We also want a fixed meeting location. You know, a place, ideally, a lease building. It's, it's much better if you can have a lease building in that sense because you can meet whenever you want, you can change the times whenever you want instead of relying on other people. But whatever it is, whatever it is that suits the, the church better to have a fixed permanent position uh, will help this church grow as well. And the last one that I mentioned was a full-time pastor. A full-time pastor, right? 
those are the things when, I, when, we get, when we get all those things in place, to me it says we're finished the job. Okay? When I look at New Life Baptist Church on the Sunshine Coast, I look at that now as a finished product. It took a while to get there. When I first got up there, I didn't know if I could preach more than once a week. I was surprised if I could even do it once a week. We started with two services. All right, let's just make sure we can get two services done, right? Eventually, we got to three services, right? Eventually, we could afford a building. Eventually, we could get that lease, right? Eventually, those things happened. But it took to the point where we had, well, we started with full-time pastors. So that's a little bit different, right, up there. Then uh, by the time we got to three services and a leased building, that took 20 months altogether. Now, maybe it could have taken shorter, a shorter time than that. Maybe. But, you know, because obviously I was flying down here midweek services as well. So I was trying to be careful not to burn out. I didn't want to be doing too much, right? So, but now that church is in a good place. We've got a fixed place. We've got a full time pastor. Uh, we've got uh, three services a week. And even more so, the men there are being trained. They're being taught. They're, re- they're able to preach. They're, they're good support. They're able to back up the pastor, right? And, and be there if I ever get sick or if I ever need to come down here. There's always men that are able to preach. And praise God today, we're working on the live stream. And that's going to be the next step, right, for an online community. It's strange because we get a lot of online listeners. And they're contributing financially to the church up there. So it's like, well, let's bless them back. Let's get a live service for those guys that, you know, might not find themselves in a good church or, or whatever. Some people have disabilities and they just can't get out of the house. And so we want to be a blessing to the people that listen to us online. So that church, as far as I'm concerned, I'm looking at that church today and I'm saying, wow, we're at a finished product. It's not perfect. It's not, it's not like we can just dump things and it's just going to continue. But listen, once you build a house... Once you build it, once it's all in, put in place, you move in, go, man, look at this brand new house, it's looking good, but eventually you need to live in it, right? And if you've got a whole bunch of kids, guess what? Holes start to make, be made in the walls, right? There's going to be wear and tear in the building, the gutter will start to leak, a bit of water, rain, or whatever, and what does, the, what does the house need now? It needs maintenance, right? It needs just constant maintenance, it just needs constant maintenance, right? And so, you know, even though the job is finished up there, in my, as far as my perspective is, it still needs maintenance, it still needs work, it still needs to continue, you know, to grow. And don't forget, the house of God is the gates to heaven. And so the work that needs, there's a work that needs to continue. Okay, we need to keep going over there at New Life Baptist Church, you know, showing the gospel, preaching the gospel, so people can believe on Jesus Christ and enter into those gates for all eternity. All right. So that's my perspective for that church, and uh, I want the same for this church. You know, and I want to be faithful to you. You know, I said when we started, I promised you, I'm going to be here for ten years if that's what it takes. And I'm not going to go back on that word. I'm going to keep doing this, brethren. I'm going to keep trying to serve this church as best as I can, try to build people, try to help the preachers, you know, teach the people. And say, well, who are you, Pastor Kevin? You know, are you, do, have you got experience building? Have you ever done this before? You know? And look, I'm going to go through a few things here. And I don't want you to think that I'm boasting. I'm not. Okay? I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. The reason I want to go through this is I just want you to have trust in the leadership here. I want you to have trust in your pastor, okay? Before I became a pastor, I just worked hard, all right? I just worked really hard, and people would put me in places where I had to basically build departments from scratch. There's work to be done. There's a hole that needs to get done, and you need to get some employees. You need to build some processes. You need to work this out, build a department. And brethren, I've done that many times, and I've always been successful at it. I just put my heart into it. Lord, I'm serving you. Please help me to build this department. Now, was it always fun? Is, is building always fun? You're, you're involved in building, brother. Is, it always, is the customer always happy? No. no. <laughs> it's a surprise when you... Man, if you get everyone happy on board, well, that's awesome, but not everyone's happy, and that's okay. You know, that's an expected uh, situation. But I've also built my family. Hey, that's my house. My family, my wife, 11 kids, raising them. I think they're good kids. I think we've done a good job so far. Maybe my wife has done a better job than me. Hey, look, I've got the experience of building people as well. You know, not just my family. Hey, but I served two years as a deacon at Victory Baptist Church where I got to know a lot of the behind the scenes things about the church, how it needs to be run. You know, I got to maybe be a Sunday school teacher for three years every week, every week preaching to the children, you know, uh, as a Sunday school teacher. Eventually, I was made the superintendent of that. You know, and as a superintendent, I was overseeing all the Sunday school classes. So any of the teachers that needed help, resources, they would come to me. You know, talking back back to my job, you know, eventually I had 50 employees under me. You know, I had like four teams in Sydney, one team in Auckland, 
Okay? Now, at that time, I hated it. At that time, I was like, man, a team in Auckland and all these guys, man, I don't even know half the jobs now, right? I mean, there's so much to do. There's so much work to be done. But when I look back now, I realize, well, maybe God was preparing me for two churches, right? Now, that's not really my desire. My desire was Sunshine Coast, relax, go to the lake and have a swim with the kids, right? I wasn't expecting to come here every week and, and, and help this church, but I'm glad I did, you know, because the spiritual things matter more than anything else, you know? And, uh, you know, I had those teams, and then my manager's in Japan. I have to go to Japan to see my manager. And then I have teams in Singapore, teams in Thailand. It got too much eventually, brethren, but I had teams everywhere. And let me tell you this. I always worked hard. I had a good reputation. I always was productive. I got the job done all the time, all the time, okay? Then, eventually, we went to my sending church. Okay, we start, church was started from scratch, right? So I got to see what it's like. Hey, from very scratch, what's it like to start a church? Learn from the things that were done well. Learn from the things that were not done so well. Okay, so I've got that experience, right? And then, like I said, we've got the Sunshine Coast Church. I think it's ready to go. I think there's a lot of great men there that are ready to step up and be a help unto me. And, you know, we started this church here, and it's still going, two years into it. Still going. You know, there was a church that got started up on the Sunshine Coast. It went for like three or four months. Independent Baptist Church. It went like three or four months. You know, full support of the, of the sending church. There were people coming up. They gave up after a few months. Hey, we're still going on the Sunshine Coast, praise God, right? And I say that not to puff myself up because it's not me, it's, it's everybody. It's everybody involved that's, that's helping me to get the job done because we're trying to serve Jesus Christ. We're trying to be faithful to the house that Jesus Christ has given us, all right? And so what I want to uh, tell you guys, uh, or, or I guess announce to you guys, some of you guys already know this, is uh, it's my desire to come here for 12 months, all right? October, October 1st, New Life Baptist Church in Queensland celebrates their three years. Sorry, guys. They celebrate the three-year anniversary. <clears throat> I don't want to leave them, right? It's a lot of work. <clears throat> we invest in people. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <clears throat> But that work's getting done, all right? That's getting done. The men are ready to step up and help out. <clears throat> I want to come and help this church. <clears throat> you guys are in Luke chapter 14, verse 28. <clears throat> Luke 14, verse 28. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> you know, you invest a lot of time, right? Investing in people, it really matters. We'll have to edit this out on the, on the YouTube, right? <laughs> Luke 14, verse 28 says, uh, For which of you, <clears throat> intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily, after he have laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that be behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Brethren, I don't want to be that man. Where we started Blessed Old Baptist Church and we didn't finish it. And then people start mocking us. People start mocking me. Hey, what, who are you? You started, you started building this thing and you didn't finish the job? Listen, up. We, we, we got a granny flat built in our, in our Bonnerig house. We got a, you know, and uh, I remember we were really excited about getting the granny flat built, right? And I remember when the, when the foundation got laid. I was like, yes! You know, it started. I can see how it starts. And, you know, the kids would run on the, on the concrete there and, and have fun, right? And it's exciting. Then the frames went up. Man, how exciting when you get the carpenter in there, he gets the wooden frames, it looks like a house now, right? With, with, the, with the roof and, and the walls, and like, yes, you know, this is awesome, look at it, it's coming up now. Could you imagine the site supervisor came up to me then? He goes, man, you seem really happy about the, the, the foundation and the framework. You're really happy by this product. All right, man, we're done. I'm not coming back. You seem happy with the finished product. Hey, yeah, I was happy with the stage that we reached, but the job's not done, right? It needs to be finished. What we build has to be finished. And brethren, I'm willing to come here for 12 months with my family, right? To relocate them from the Sunshine Coast, to come here. And, uh, you know, I've already spoken to some of the men in the church here about that. 
And uh, it's not, I don't really want to do it because I'm really comfortable there. You don't really want to relocate your family. There's no personal or sort of financial reasons behind it, but there's a need at Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And the need is that we need to finish it. We need to finish the work. I'm very thankful for all the men that have been serving here. I'm very thankful for Brother Dave and Brother Luke and Brother Anthony. And I can't, has anyone else preached? I don't know, but you know, for preaching, for song leaders, for getting up here and preaching. Thank you for your, for your giving, the financials that, that are coming in from, from the families. Just your attendance is a blessing. Just seeing your faces is a blessing to me, you know. But we need to finish the work. And what it said there in Luke 14 is we need to count the costs and we need to see if we can finish the job. You know, sometimes finishing a job requires financial giving. It requires a bit of financial sacrifice, you know. And uh, relocating my family is going to cost a bit of money, you know. It's going to cost this church a little bit of money. And, and I guess what I'm, what I'm letting you guys know is there will be a financial cost. I, I don't normally mention financials, especially in sermons, but it's going to cost a little bit to get my family down here, okay? But I know we're going to be able to bless this church. I know we're going to be able to get to the next stage that we need to get to, right? I know we're going to be able to do that. And at the same time, even though the job is finished, you know, at New Life Baptist Church, I still need to go see them. It's maintenance, maintenance, okay? Things will still happen. You know, when Jesus Christ was with his disciples for three years, and then he was arrested, right? He invested in them every day for three years. Then he gets arrested. What does Peter do? He denies Christ. <laughs> was he ready to be left alone? Well, eventually that was an experience that he had to go through, okay, to be a, to be a great apostle for, for Christ. And so, you know, by, by leaving the guys there, you know, I, I don't want to see things fall over. You know, I, I don't want to see holes to be, or if the holes do come up, we can fix those. We can get those, uh, you know, uh, maintained. So I'm going to try to make, you know, weekly trips up there to the Sunshine Coast. But all of this is going to cost something, okay? I've counted the cost and I think we can do it. I think it's going to be beneficial for Blessed Hope Baptist Church. If you guys have any questions about that, please, please ask me, okay? Please ask me uh, your questions. Now, please go to, uh, please go to uh, Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. We'll, we'll end on this one. Mark chapter 14. Now, I'm just going to read some passages to you because the church is called the house of God. But there's also another name given to the church. Okay, I'll just read it to you in Ephesians 2, uh, 1, 22. It says, And have put all things under his feet, that's under the feet of Jesus, and gave him to be the head of all things, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. What is another name for the church? The body of Christ. Okay, now 2,000 years ago when Christ was walking on this earth in his physical body, he did amazing works. He preached the gospel, did amazing miracles, right? Well, now he's in heaven, but his body is still here. His body is still working, and that's your local New Testament church, okay? We are not just the house of God. We are also the body of Christ. And of course, if Christ's desire was to see people in heaven, that's our, that's our goal. That's our aim. We know we're trying to get people to the gates of heaven, show them, walk through these doors, believe on Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, the body of Christ. Now, the reason I make mention of this is because I want you to remember the first house of God that was mentioned. When Jacob, he set up a pillar, you know, the pillar and ground of truth. And what did he do? He anointed it with oil, right? He anointed it. You say, what is that about? Well, let's have a look here. You can see the pictures. You can see how think these things start to form together. Mark 14, verse 3. Mark 14 and verse number 3. It says, And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, and uh, spikenard, very precious, very precious, right? And she break the box and poured it on his head. All right, so this woman takes what is probably her most expensive, her most precious item, this perfume, this oil, right? It's very expensive. And she pours it on the head of Jesus Christ. What did Jacob do? He anointed the pillar with oil, right? Let's keep going. Verse number four. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. So you see, you know, she's trying to honor Christ. She wants to anoint his body, right? She wants to take the best of what she has and give it to Jesus. And there are others watching and saying, why'd you waste that money? You could have sold it. You could have given it to the poor. You could have done all these other things with what, you know, with what you just did. You just wasted it. 
you know? Look at Jesus, number six, verse number six. And Jesus said, let her alone, alone. Why trouble ye her? She have wrought a good work on me. Look at this. For ye have all, sorry, for ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do them good, but me ye have not always. She have done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. This woman knew that Jesus was going to be buried. She knew she was going to die. She had a faith on Jesus Christ. She was a believer. And she anoints his body for the burying. She brings the best. She brings her most expensive item. And others said, hey, that's a waste. Why are you doing that? And brethren, the reason I want to bring this up is because I just want to be realistic with you. It's, it is going to cost this church some money, you know, to bring the Sepulveda's here. All right? They say, what, are you Jesus? Are you going to be anointed with the oil? No, it's not me. I'm not anointing me. What is the pillar? The pillar that was, was the ground of truth was the church, right? You take, Jacob took the oil and he put it upon the pillar. Okay? And this woman, that pillar represents the body. We are the body of Jesus Christ. And we see this woman take a precious ointment, something that was very costly to her, probably saved up her whole life to afford this, and pours it upon the head of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ. And brethren, yes, there's going to be some financial questions to be, to be made uh, to, to bring me here. But brethren, I want to do it because I want to serve this church. I want to be faithful to this church. I want to finish the job. We need to finish the job. We can't be just, just content with the framework. right? The outside cladding needs to be done. The inside, the electrical, the tiling. We need to finish the house. And brethren, I'm committed to this church 100%. Okay, now I'm, I guess I'm, uh, no, I'm 100%. I'm part-time still, right? But for the 12 months that I desire to come here, it'll be from October to September next year, uh, I want to be your full-time pastor. I want to be a full-time pastor, and I want to take the men that are willing to preach, maybe one day I want to be in the ministry, and train them up, okay? Train them up so they can be, uh, you know, pe- preachers of the truth. They can be strong pillars as well for the local church. I really want to invest heavily in this church, and I have no doubt that if, I, if we do this, and it's going to cost a bit of ointment, it's going to cost a bit, okay? But to me, what are we investing in anyway? Was it the building or was it the people? What was the lively stones that Jesus Christ is building? It was the people. We want to invest spiritually. I want you guys, I want fathers, to, I want you guys to be the best fathers you can be. I want you to hear the best preaching that will help you be the best fathers, the best husbands, mothers to be the best mothers, best wives, children to be the best children, so we can be the best employees, so we can be the best for Jesus Christ, so we can be a light to this world, you know. And brethren, it all starts with this building, us, right, the lively stones, and uh, we've started the work. We've gone two years into it. It's going well. I'm super happy. Just like I saw the frames go up, I was super happy, but there's more to be done, right? And so I really ask uh, you guys to, to think about this. Please be praying about this. It requires a, a, a lot of work. Uh, you know, relocating a family of 11 kids is, is not easy, you know. Um, but let me say to you, that the, the families at, Blessed, at, at New Life Baptist Church, I spoke to all of them before I'm telling you this, and they, they were all supportive. Like, they want you guys to have what they have up there, you know. All right, let's pray.